Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the IEEE Communications Society, the IEEE Photonic Society, Optica, and my fellow co-chairs Chris and Ming Jun, I welcome you to IFC 2023, the world's premier international event for the latest advances in optical communications and networking. I am very happy to be here on stage in San Diego with a live audience and to see so many friends and colleagues joining us online. The technologies that we research and develop here keep people connected. I'm very proud to be part of the industry, but we still have a lot of work to do, and I believe this OFC is an important milestone forward. This year's program is exciting and includes highlights of recent progress in research and technology. Each year, OFC presents seven days with a comprehensive program, including topical sessions, live demonstrations, unique special events, and celebrations. OFC is the platform from the groundbreaking solutions to global challenges driving the industry today. But more than ever, OFC is a place to interact with colleagues and friends across the world to make new connections as we come together as a community. At this OFC, researchers, engineers, technology experts, business leaders, and others will discover, discuss, and debate the latest technological developments in optics and photonics. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Where, where's your tie? Where, where's your shirt? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OFC 2023 features the latest research and development results covering advanced areas like DSP for coherent and direct detection, uh, in, implemented in multiple material systems, low latency links, and optical signal processing. Other areas are 400, 800 G, and 1.6 tera transceivers, enabled by novel high-speed components and photonic integrated circuits uh, in different material systems, targeting pluggable, board-mounted, and co-packaged form factors. Some of the non-traditional areas are 5G, edge computing, access, LIDAR, quantum, satellite optical comm. We invite you to review the program in detail. Finally, we will be hosting a conversation with our plenary speakers uh, right after this is over in Theater 3 at 10.15 a.m. Sounds exciting, Chris. Yeah, the show floor will be exciting too, showing hot topics, which are one unique aspect of OFC 2023. Hundreds of global organizations will show their innovation, products, and research. The show floor will also host several educational sessions and intro op demos showcasing cutting technologies. This session will provide insight into hot topics, market trends, and state of the industry, and emerging technologies. We are very proud to share more about this year's OFC Net. OFC Net saw first light in 2022 in partnership with CINEC and Lumen. CINEC, the Corporation for Education Network Initiative in California, connects California to the world. Advancing education and research statewide by providing the world-class computing network essential for innovation, collaboration, and the economic growth. In 2022, Lumen laid the final piece of OFC net and brought dark fiber into San Diego Convention Center. This year, in 2023, we have already 19 organizations came together to support large-scale optical networking demonstrations. Nine companies contributed equipment to extend the reach of the demonstration across multiple booths. This connectivity provides new opportunities for exhibitors who collaborate with academic institutions to highlight advancement and the capabilities in a live, real-time, 
fully operational network environment. Exhibitors participating in OSCNet may also have the opportunity to present their demonstrations to an audience in the show floor theaters. This is uh, just the beginning of an incredible collaboration platform for industry, government, and academia to share their discoveries that are driving innovations around the world. Visit the OFC night booth around the, the exhibit hall to see the network in action. Please, everyone, let us now thank all our exhibitors, sponsors, and OSNet partners who contribute to make OSC the most single important annual event in optical communication and networking. <laughs> Be sure to stop by the exhibit hall open right after this session. We welcome you again to OIC 2023. Thanks. So, before I introduce our first plenary speaker, the three of us would like to thank the entire OFC 2023 program committee, and most especially the technical program chairs, Nick Fontaine, Fotini Carinou, and Elaine Wong. They have dedicated an enormous amount of their valuable time to bring you this exclusive program, rich in expert insight and real world examples. Thanks. Now, each year, the general chairs select the individuals who inspire us by making great strides in science and technology. People who are driving breakthrough innovations for a better future. And we are incredibly proud to offer you three outstanding speakers, starting with Mrs. Patricia Obonai. Patricia Obonai is an experienced leader in Ghana's telecommunication industry. She was named CEO of Vodafone Ghana in April 2019 making her the first Ghanaian female to hold the position. Patricia has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Electronic Engineering from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, an Executive MBA in Project Management from the University of Ghana Business School, an Executive Education from the Kellogg School of Management, London's Business School, and INSET in France. She's passionate about the future of young people and women in the digital age, and is a vigorous advocate for STEM. She has advocated for youth and women on a variety of local and international platforms, including the UN General Assembly panel sessions. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Obonai. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Don't ask me whether I'm jet lagged, I'm fine. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be here with you today and to share on a very important subject which is very dear to my heart. I engage with this subject almost every day in the way I work. As you may have heard, I am an electrical engineer and I've been a technology director for a significant part of my career. So before I became CEO, I had to move into a commercial role to run the business, and I engaged my frontline. So I had an understanding of what customer service, frontline, back office, et cetera, was about. But then when I became CEO, I said, guys, let's sit and decide how we're going to change this company. So typical, two areas of growth. Let's look at growth and let's look at efficiency. So for efficiency, I had to bring my knowledge in technology to the table and say, let's digitize. Let's become more digital, let's transform using digital. Today, we have about 15 bots in the organization looking at our backend processes. We have engaged a lot of technology in the way we serve our customers using AI, et cetera. But that really, when I think about it, is this the social change? Is this what it is all about, transforming my company? using technology? No. I think for all of you gathered here, what we should see in our scope of work is that we're changing lives. 
We are touching lives by the very technologies that we develop and the way we use it. And I give you an example. So in my work in the back office, we looked at our customer base and we realized that we are actually missing out on people who are either speech impaired or completely deaf. So we asked ourselves, how do they engage our back office? How do they engage our company when they need support for their services? There's rural urban migration. So what happens when these people move to the city to work and they're supposed to be in touch with their families? How do they engage? And so we sat down and we said, why do we not work with technology to drive social change? So what did we do? We employed a number of people who could sign, taught a number of people in the organization how to sign. We introduced video calling into our contact centers. We worked with the Ghana Association of the Deaf, and we decided to employ the technology in the way in, in the midst of the association members. And today, they don't need to call somebody to pass on the message to our contact center. Through basic digital services, through basic video calling, they're able to call. There will be an agent sitting there helping you. We gave them good data packages that could allow them to call. And the reason why I bring this example as an example of using digital to drive social change is that one old man said to me, not an old man, but mid-age, he said, I don't have to do the four-hour travel to see my family, not because I don't want to, but now I have access to technology. I'm able to sit in Accra, I'm able to go on video calling, and I'm able to sign. Now that's heartwarming. That means that you have been able to reduce the distance of travel for this person, he's able to communicate better, you have created a job, and you have used technology to drive change. And if you visit them, every year we do, and it's, it's so incredible to see the change that this is making in the lives of people just because we introduced them to technology and handed off devices to them. So when I talk about us looking at new efficiencies for our business, what digital is doing, new opportunities, I'm not here to explain that because I know many of you do that already. Digitalization has evolved and many people are using that to drive their businesses. But it is in empowering individuals, empowering communities to make a change. For me, that is where the potential, the potential of digitalization sits. If you look at how we have used it, especially in Africa, and COVID brought so much to light, and I'm sure you've read and heard many of the stories, but sometimes when you share stories, it brings a lot to light. People didn't have access to content. What we did was to build content. Yes, you'd have websites with very general educative information, and so yes, you can zero rate it, but what about the relevant data that will make a difference in the life of the child? Putting it on what we call instant schools, going around schools to do activation, Today, more than 25,000 students and children in Ghana are all connected and they can engage basic curriculum, whether at home or in school. Teachers have been trained and they can use the instant platform. This means that should any pandemic strike, these kids will still have access to content on very affordable devices and be able to use it. Today, 20% of women die in many countries because of hemorrhage on the way to the hospital. Things that we take for granted. On the way to the hospital, she can die because she was bleeding, she's pregnant, she has to see a doctor, and she died on the way because she couldn't have access to transport. People cannot afford the basic cost of transport. The roads are so bad that people are not able to get the taxi drivers, the, 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 the cops are not willing to go to where this woman is. But what can we use the power of digital, the power of technology to achieve? We have been able to come up with a solution where in partnership with governments, in different countries, as in Tanzania, as in Lesotho, and we're rolling out in Ghana, you can have technology in between. There is a contact center where it's publicized and very basic USSD, this woman can reach the contact center. The transport officers are already connected to this platform as well. 
And the woman just calls, I need help. I'm off to the hospital, can I get a car? She doesn't have to pay. Through partnership between government and private sector, we're able to pay for this transport. This woman moves and this transport officer is paid through mobile money and I'll come to mobile money shortly. This is impactful. This is changing society, this is changing lives. This woman can now visit the hospital safely and have a baby and not die from hemorrhage. I can't finish talking about agriculture. There are many farmers today, probably 90% of farmers have mobile phones. Very small basic feature phones. They are small hold farmers they don't know what to do with the produce that they come up with after they fed their family and sent a little to the community. Just having access to weather information, just having access to the marketplace, just having access to building credit on his phone so that he can access, be able to buy farm inputs are things that we take for granted, but if we want to use digitalization to drive change, then you have to bring it to the doorstep of this farmer. And that is what we've done with a number of platforms that we have, whether the Connected Farmer platform, DigiFarm. What you do is to bring the technology so close to him and make it basic. You don't have to expose the technology to him, just explain to him the benefits. The benefits of just dialing a short code and be able to access, oh, it's going to rain. Actually, there's this person I can send tomatoes to, this person needs tomatoes and I can send it to him. What you have done is not just introduce technology, what you have done is provide this man or this woman a long-term sustainable employment, a way to take care of his family, stop depending on the economy, be able to drive the social development that you want to see in the life of that parent. Many of you have heard about mobile money in Africa. 25% of the population are banked in Ghana, the rest are unbanked. You see that the person doesn't have the basic credit to be able to open the account. The person doesn't have the work, even the, the, the present, getting to a bank hall is intimidating. The person earns income, a daily income, daily wage. And so how much are you going to be able to raise to get into the banking um, hall? And in your village, there's no bank branch. The banks won't come there. So then what do you do? So the mobile operator stepped in and said, you have a device. It doesn't have to be a feature, a smartphone. Just with that device, you can walk to an agent, give him the cash that you generate on a daily basis. He will give you electronic cash back on the phone, and that's it. With that electronic cash, you're able to send, you're able to receive money. You're, with the wallet that has been created, you can send, you can receive money, you can pay bills. You can pay your school fees, your child's school fees, you can save, you can build credit, you can now take, have access to loans from banks. It is incredible. It is phenomenal. 17 million of the 32 million people in Ghana have mobile money wallets, compared to what it would have taken to wait for the banks. And I can tell you this is transformational. I always share this story and I will share it with you. I had the opportunity of meeting a woman in, in some of our cultures. Many of the women will work and then you give the money to your husband. Now when this husband passes, the money that he, you have given to him or whatever he had is his inheritance and his family comes for it. So this poor woman has nothing. Her kids can't fall out of school. When you educate her to be able to save this money on her phone, what you have done is to save generations. Because now she can build credit for herself. Now she can pay the fees directly for her kids. More importantly, she can access a loan if her support, if her husband passes. He doesn't even have to pass, but if she needs help, she can grow her business. And this is now, if you know how children and mothers are, are, in, are so interlinked and, and together, I can tell you, it makes a difference in the lives of the children, in the lives of the woman, the, the, the social treatment of the woman is curtailed when she, she's financially um, included and she's financially engaged. When we use the technologies that we have, 
we will not just use it to drive profits, we are using it to drive social change. I can't even talk about governance. So during COVID, we had population movements. So, and what was, how was government going to understand how people were moving? So we partnered with the Ghana Statistical Service and said we have aggregated anonymized data. So we don't breach anybody's privacy. We worked with an NGO called Data for Good and we partnered with the Ghana Statistical Service. And you can see private NGO and then um, government working together. And with the anonymized data, we were able to tell population movement. We were able to tell how people were moving and so could tell how the disease was spreading or being carried around through contact tracing, after you've done contact tracing. This has been so useful during COVID, but now you can use it to plan transportation, to be able to plan agriculture, how to plan how to set, send fertilizers, et cetera, things like that. And if we have another pandemic, we're in a better place. Using the digitalization that we've all been talking about to even affect our governance. As for business, if I start, we won't finish, so let me move on. But for all that I'm talking about to be sustainable, we must make it accessible to all, and that's the core of the problem that I'm going to discuss with you quickly. If you look at the stats, yes, we have internet coverage. Some countries have deeper penetration of internet access, but generally for Africa, it's still low, and if you have, if you look at fixed broadband, it's about 0.4% of the population have access. And when, again, when COVID struck, it became so real because you had people who had stopped working from the office and had to move home. And homes are not as wired as Europe is in Africa. So people didn't have access to broadband in the house. Even when I break it down to mobile coverage, see how low the penetration is. Yes, in some countries it's better, but generally in Africa and some countries, it's so very, very low. So yes, people don't even have access to coverage to start with. If you don't have the mobile network, if you don't have fixed broadband, then how are you going to have access to everything that we are talking about to be able to drive the change? The other one is the device. In Ghana, we say we have 140% mobile penetration and we clap for ourselves. However, what this truly means is that one individual has two or three SIM cards. And so the true penetration is actually 60%. There's about 40% of the population who don't own handsets and it's shared in the community or in the home. So if you want to take a call, you go and receive it in the neighbor's house. Now, how are you going to drive social change if the person does not have access to device, he may be sitting under mobile coverage, but he doesn't have access to a device. And that's another problem that we need to address. During COVID, the number of kids had to stay at home for over six months. Because yes, they had the mobile coverage. Okay, they had the devices, but everything was in textbooks and not digitized. And so they couldn't have access to digital content. These, everything I'm saying about the weather, the farm produce, et cetera, somebody has to digitize it, make the content available for people to be able to use. And we have huge opportunity. When people say they're looking for jobs, I say there's so much to do. There's so much to do. There's so much to do. Either we create the coverage, we find the devices, how we can make it affordable for people, or we actually digitize the content and make it accessible to people who need it. I say that computer literacy is not digital literacy. So the fact that the person has access to the computer or the phone does not mean that he can engage with the apps. Does not mean that he can do online banking. He can do online purchase. He can do online trading. Set up a small mom and pop shop online and be able to trade. And so digital literacy is a gap that needs to be closed if we want to use digitalization to drive social change. So how do we expand this access I'm talking about? If you look at what the UN Broadband um, Commission for Sustainable Development said, they said the infrastructure gap in Africa, it's about $100 billion. So 
So if we want to achieve universal broadband access by 2030, that's how much money we need. Some of the biggest telcos that I know probably spend about a billion dollars in Africa every year. So when are we going to close the 100 billion gap and fix this problem if you want to drive social change? How can we make devices more? And I'm sure I'm speaking to a lot of engineers, a lot of manufacturers, a lot of decision makers. How do you make the devices affordable so people can get it and it's not just about making a phone call, but it's about changing the lives of people? Telcos cannot do this on their own. Private sector cannot do this on their own. In the past, we would say, oh, there will be donors who would help Africa or who would help countries who need the support. Today, almost every country is going through its own reconstruction after everybody had been hit. Everybody is reinvesting, we're looking at where to put finances. Governments are busy focusing partly on digitalization, partly on road construction, partly on fixing the economy. And so not one entity will be able to address this problem I'm talking about. It has to be a deeper collaboration on all the sectors. So investors, the private sector, the NGOs, government will have to work together. I give an example quickly. When we worked on rural connectivity in Ghana, it was very clear that the opportunity was there, but I couldn't take it alone. So we partnered with government and this year we put 500 sites, 500 rural communities have been connected because government brought the land, they worked with the chiefs to bring the land, they worked with manufacturers to give us the equipment, I brought my spectrum, I brought my customer base, I brought my marketing strength, I brought my backhaul, and we have been able to connect 500 communities. So it's practical, it's real, if we put our minds to it, we should be able to drive the change that we are talking about. You know I will not say this with, I will not talk about women and children. 50% of the population of Ghana, and I probably think Africa as well, are women. They make the purchasing decisions in their homes, and the men here will agree with me. So how do we not engage them in the technologies that we are designing and developing? Women and, and, and the young girls have to be part of the process, not wait till it's done before they use it. If you look at the statistics, many young girls start with very in, uh, interested in science and maths, and then by the time they are getting to the university, they are told it's too difficult, they are told they won't get jobs, they won't get husbands, and many people drop off and find what they think can be easy to fit in. But we need the minds. Nine million digital jobs will be created in the next five years, and we'll have fewer people to be able to take this job. Why have we left out the 50% of the population who have the potential to be able to do this? I think we should engage the young girls, we should engage women. We're running a program in Ghana, you can check it, it's called Code Like a Girl. We open it up 3,000 girls a year and we trade them to code. You don't have to grow up to become an engineer, but if you have the mind to problem solve, you can make a difference with that knowledge that we pass on to you. We must all work together to ensure that no one is left behind. As we talk about the, the optical fibers, as we talk about new technologies, I entreat us all to think about making change, making an impact, driving social change. I leave you with this. Digitalization is not about technology. It's about people. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Patricia, for this excellent talk. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thanks. We now have the privilege of introducing these year awards recipients from the three co-sponsoring societies. These individuals are recognized for outstanding achievements in their respective fields. And these awards and honors will be presented later today during a special awards ceremony luncheon, which is supported by Corning Incorporated. It is our great pleasure to introduce a short awards presentation honoring their collective impact on the optical communications industry.
we are truly honored to have many recipients in the audience today. So will all of today's award winners please stand? <laughs> Finally, we now wish to recognize the winner of the John Tyndall Award one of the highest honors in our community. The Tyndall Award recognizes outstanding contributions to fiber optics technology. This award is co-sponsored by the IEEE Photonic Society and Optica and supported by Corning. The 2023 recipient of the John Tyndall Award is Ming Jung Lee, Corning and OFC 2023 General Chair. Optical fiber, pulses of light that flit across a glass core. The result, an astonishing ability to transmit information and connect individuals around the world. For more than 30 years, Ming Jun Li has been an alchemist with light. As a third year student at Beijing Institute of Technology, he took a course on fiber optics, which was then an emerging field. When Ming saw guided light through an optical fiber for the first time, he marveled at how glass as thin as hair could transmit light. It was like magic, he said, and his career path was set. At Corning since 1993, he has participated in research and development for nearly every one of their new fiber products and fiber attribute improvements. Ming is a named inventor on more than 260 U.S. patents and has published articles in over 330 journals and conference proceedings. In 2004, he worked with colleagues Dana Bookbinder and Pushkar Tandon to make fiber with a new low-index glass structure. When the fiber was tested, it had much lower bending loss than the standard single-mode fiber. Their discovery resulted in the Clear Curve ZBL single mode fiber product. Clear Curve fiber, which adds a protective rail around a skinny glass core, can be wrapped with many turns on a small mandrel without losing light. This makes it faster and less expensive to deploy fiber to the home systems. His work at Corning continues to push the limits of glass to further reduce fiber loss and increase bandwidth from reduced fiber diameters for increasing the fiber density in cables to an exploration of space division multiplexing using new types of multi-core or few mode fibers. To invent, to bend, twist, and turn light. That is the magic in the work of Ming Jun Li. Congratulations to our colleague, Ming Jung Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Ramon and I are grateful for Ming adding gravitas to our team. So, um, Our next plenary speaker is Jayshri Ulal. She's the president and chief executive officer of Arista Network, a role she has held for the past decade. She led the company to a very successful IPO in 2014 uh, and to $4.4 billion in revenue last year. Formerly, Jay Shri was the senior vice president of Cisco, responsible for a $10 billion uh, data center switching and services business. With more than 30 years of networking experience, she is the recipient of numerous awards, including Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year in 2015, Barron's World's Best CEOs in 2018, and one of Fortune's top 20 business persons in 2019. Earlier this year, Jeshri was awarded a Global Indian Award from the Economic Times of India. Jeshri holds a BS in Electrical Engineering and an MS in Engineering Management. She is the recipient of San Francisco State University and Santa Clara University Distinguished Alumni Awards in 2013 and 2016, respectively. 
In the next 30 minutes, Jay Shri will discuss the road to petascale cloud networking. Please join me in welcoming Jay Shri. Good morning, everybody. Wow, thank you for that introduction, Chris. And how inspiring to see all of the awards and optical expertise. I think you've all forgotten more than I can ever speak on that topic. But it's great to be here, and it's especially great to be here, you know, post the COVID era. We all have a lot of fatigue doing collaboration. And much as, much as it's been powerful, perhaps touching and seeing and really, really connecting with everything we do is one of the greatest parts of the Optical Fiber Conference. Today I'm going to share with you some of my experiences and technologies, and especially represent Arista on our path to petascale networking. It, of course, has a high touch of optical, but it has many other components that one has to think about before we even get to the optical piece of it. So I'll talk a little bit about Arista. I know Chris gave a warm introduction. Uh, it's a, one of, been one of the fastest growing companies that I got a chance to be part of with Andy Bechtelschein, our founder, and Ken Duda, right from the ground up when we were zero. We'll talk about some of the trends that made Arista happen with cloud, and today a greater trend that's emerging with cloud scale, and the path to petascale and what's required to make that happen. Bandwidth is one thing, but the pressure to attack that bandwidth with the right latency, predictability, throughput, lossless network is very key. And finally, of course, the reason we're all here, we'll talk about the O in optical and wrap up after that. All in 30 minutes at peta speeds, obviously. Let's go back again now uh, to the 1990s. And I, uh, you heard I have a career that you know, goes by. Wendell and I were talking yesterday. We go back a few years. We now measure our career in decades, not just in years. So we therefore get to be historians and talk about the past more than we do often the present and the future. And so looking back in the past, I want to compare how networking has evolved the way desktops have evolved. Many of you may remember, we all used to sometimes even build our own des desktops, whether it was a Radio Shack or a Compact, and you know, now we all pretty much buy them off the shelf. It's a consolidating industry, where you don't worry about the disk drive or the graphic controllers or the display or the screen. You just build a whole system, and you heard Patricia talk about the systems, and the impact of that in every country, in every individual, in every girl, in every person. Today also, you, we've gone from a myriad of operating system choices, whether it was Windows or Solaris, and I'd be dating myself if I went back to the DEC and the VAX clusters. And today again, you've come to a consolidated OS that's largely based on Linux or based on Unix. And then in the past, you also had different types of desktops for consumers, for enterprise. And this world is collapsing as well to a multi-cloud era where all of these, in essence, become an extension of the cloud, whether they are mobile devices or iPads or large systems. I believe in the 2020s, the networking industry is, has and is going through that kind of consolidation, where you now have to worry about the traffic, not just north, south, east, west, but really 360 degrees. And we are building massively large networks, what we call a leaf and a spine topology, to deal with this traffic. And often it has to be built in tiers, whether it's 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig, 800 and 1.6 terabit. That traffic pattern requires you to deal with active, active topologies, the ability to take traffic across IP, across Ethernet, across optical, and build an N-way spine, an multi-way spine, and connect to it different kinds of leaves, as we call them. And these leaves power our different applications. It could be compute, storage, private or hybrid cloud, web 2.0, 3.0, campus branch, and two especially ones that are pressuring the network even more and more today are the cloud and the AI and ML workloads that go with that, as well as, of course, the optical interconnects that go with that. We work with some of the largest cloud titans in the world, or hyperscalers, and you know there's only a handful of them. And yet they are pushing not only bandwidth, but a very important topic today, which is the power efficiency. They're building some of the world's largest global data centers that are hundreds of megawatts, sometimes gigawatts and terawatts, and they build them in distributed centers. 
And I often like to say, it's not that they just build data centers, they build centers of data. And that center of data could be a large megawatt where they build multiple racks of pods and spines and distribute the traffic regionally, or it could be even a small branch. And so the power of data across these centers is what the clouds are making possible for each and every one of us. Arista has actually emerged as one of the leaders and probably one of the fastest growing companies in this high performance networking sector. And you can see here an independent data from a market analyst that shows that just in 100, 200, and 400 gig alone, Arista is now the largest market share in ports at over 40%. And still, of course, we're competing with some large juggernauts and some of my ex-industry peers. And so we all have a lot to do here and a lot to go. One of the things that makes that possible is the silicon industry. You all know that Moore's law is very alive and well. And the geometry of transistors has been literally doubling every two years and growing from 100 nanometers to today in the 2021, 22, 23 era, we're down to seven, five, and three nanometer. And the transistors have grown from a few hundred thousand to millions and billions. This makes possible a number of electrical switches and high bandwidth that Arista and many companies can take advantage of to get the electrical part of our switching right. We've gone now from 25 terabit surges to 50 terabit capacity, moving on to hundreds of terabits. And this is possible because of the geometry of using merchant silicon to really make this happen. But I'm here to tell you that we are going to push the envelope of electrical and very soon optical even more with the next workload that gets on the cloud, which is artificial intelligence. Sometimes I think the word AI gets mis misused and perhaps we should rename it RI and call it real intelligence because there are so many emerging applications now in our daily lives to make this possible. The large scale M ML has exceeded any forecast imaginable. Natural language models are now going from the billions of parameters to a trillion parameters. Early results have been very, very impressive. Google Lambda, the Megatron, the Bloom, all of these are pushing the envelope and they're really coming out of the labs of neural nets to become real applications that affect our daily lives for recommendation engines, training engines, inference engines. And these AI ML clusters don't necessarily first start with a network, they start with processors, a special kind of high-end general, G, going beyond general processors to GPUs that have anywhere from hundreds to thousands to 10,000 GPUs that generate a tremendous amount of bandwidth and therefore networking bandwidth to connect all of this IO is a very limiting factor. Targeting these AI ML clusters in the future therefore requires terabits of GPU capacity to build petascale networks. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that's built. First, to build these GPUs, you need servers. And these aren't often general purpose servers, but they're actually very specialized servers. As an example, Facebook Meta, most recent server announcement was based on a eight cluster of H100 NVIDIA GPU platforms. And this is an AI ML chassis with multi terabits, gigabits, petabits, that have to connect all of these 400 and 800 gig slots. And NVIDIA's DGX is one of the most popular ones that has eight A100 GPUs and when an was announced back in May 2020. These are examples of very, very high-end servers powering and clustering the AI ML workloads. Another example would be Google's TPUs, TensorFlow processors as they're called. And you can see here that every year the TPUs have exceeded the chip density and also go on, gone from petaflops to exaflops, 10x almost every two years, a combination of both faster chips and very large clusters. And the prediction in 23 is you can go from an exaflop to 10 exaflops. It's, it's just getting faster and faster and denser and denser. The large language models that sit on these GPUs is a huge consideration. ChatGPT, which has been one of the rages and apparently hit a million users in just five days, is already training 175 billion parameters. 
Megatron natural language models are over half a billion, 500 billion, sorry, meg models. And it's trending to go to a t trillion models in the future. AI models are touching our human lives as well, whether it's marketing content, speech, advertising, video, 3D, imaging, code. It's now not just back in the labs. Just about every aspect of what we do is being powered by AI. Now, what does this all mean? Why are we discussing AI so much? Because it is both compute and data intensive. If you look at a typical AI-driven sparse matrix, you run the data across billions of parameters, and then you do a, a whole gather, search, reduce, and you share all of the adjustments across the parameters simultaneously. And then you update all of the parameters globally every step of the way. This process of compute, reduce, exchange across the peers is very data and compute intensive and happens repeatedly in what's called a data parallel training for different kinds of traffic patterns. You're going back and forth, shuffling over and over again. Not only do your GPUs need to respond, but the I.O. has to have an immediate response. It cannot have idle states. It can, the GPUs can't be waiting for it because that's precious time, precious latency that you're using for it. So this typical structure of a distributed AI therefore requires something much more than we have today. You add to this the fact that your parameters are going 10x, and then on top of that, the features required are going 40x. You need bigger models, bigger GPUs, and larger networks. AI networking promises to be far greater than what we have already deployed for today's cloud and optical networking. And so if you step back and look at some of the attributes you need to be able to do that, the first thing you need is not only to be able to go fast, but to go predictably, without loss, without congestion. A lossless fabric to deal with the many forms of AI communication and yet handle it gracefully without dropping packets. Whether you have large flows, elephant flows, you've got to synchronize all of these packets to make it run smoothly. Just fast lanes isn't good enough. Predictable lanes is extremely important. You also need to move more and more to state-of-the-art technologies, the IP, the state-of-the-art Ethernet, and be able to do reliable transfers, not just across the transport protocol, but also have the right restartability, resilience, availability, but when, because when things fail, they fail very long and create billions of dollars of outages. So the benefit of combining standards-based protocols the, so that you have the right resilience, active, active, one goes, the other comes, and it comes up fast is extremely um, important in real time. And finally, visibility and telemetry. You can have a fast network, and yet you can have a choking point. And to identify those applications at the applica application level, at the network level, at the path level, at the protocol level, at the DWDM level, at the optical level, is critical to building a holistic network. One of the key reasons that this is so important is you've got to build the right foundation. You can have all of the architectural principles, but if you don't have the right architecture, then you won't be able to get there. So a couple of key things in the architecture required is the non-blocking, high-performance, terabit-scale going to petabit-scale network. You've got to make sure it's no drop. A virtual output queuing architecture allows you to, at the both the ingress and the egress, deliver these packets at fast speed, but also make sure they're not collision-free. You've got to have a proven transport architecture that can not only go direct memory across different transports, but also be re able to respond to that transport with deep buffers to reduce the pause, the congestion, per flow control, explicit congestion control. The combination of all these means it's not just about bandwidth, it's about synchronized flows. It's just not about packet latency, it's about your entire end-to-end -end workload latency. It, a lossless network matters. The optical internet connecting to that matter, network matters even more. You also need to think more about the software features and make sure they're more programmable at the data plane, management plane, control plane. You have to have extensive monitoring so that you can look at what's going on at every microsecond interval, every nanosecond interval. The right de debuggability, flow tracing capability, the aggregate of counters and monitors, the real-time streaming of telemetry makes the software as important embedded and infused into the hardware as the architecture itself. 
This is an example of a real-world AI spine that Arista has constructed. And you can see here, very often, everyone's well known for the front end of the network, where you're connecting a large amount of 400 gigabits across a leaf spine architecture and building what I'd call the data center cloud network. But for every front end network, there's also a back end network. And these back end networks typically used to be connected with CPU storage, often, you know, serial ATAs, you know, PCIX, et cetera. But now, increasingly, for these AI intensive workloads, you need a dedicated back end AI spine that goes beyond the compute and memory clusters to build an equivalent network like you did in the front end. Now, how do you build this network? Well, clearly, they come in different sizes and different shapes, depending on what you're trying to do. So let's take a look. For example, if you're just within a server, like I showed you, you don't need a lot. You need the I.O. to go very, very fast across, let's say, 10 to 100 XPUs. They could be GPUs, TPUs, et cetera. And the type of apps you're dealing with here are more small, simple. And your AI options here, from in terms of network, may not be a network at all. It could be a simple I.O. connection like PCIe or CXL or NVIDIA's NVLink. So this allows you to just sort of pass back, back and forth in a bus type of topology, and you're not really getting out of the server chassis, if you will. If you start getting out of the server chassis, then you need a rack scale or a pod scale. And this is where the least fine topology really shines, where you may have an InfiniBand type of network for high performance compute, or you may have an Ethernet network, especially as InfiniBand and Ethernet are approaching the same speed and becoming more and more at heavy workloads predictable in latency in a similar fashion. You would typically apply this over moderate applications, where you're getting out of the chassis, out of the server compute, and starting to put racks and racks of compute and build multiple pods, if you will, connecting into a spine. And finally, the picture I showed you before, the AI spine. This is when you start worrying about the billions of parameters, the trillions of parameters, and you need a data center scale that connects not just thousands of GPUs, but 10,000 or 100,000 GPUs. Everything from how you cool it, how you connect it, how you immerse it, how you design it is non-trivial. Because you're now creating the supercomputer in a completely distributed fashion for the, a new generation of AI loads. And these are typically, therefore, powered by large AI apps and must, therefore, have a real network with Ethernet and IP powering it. And this is a lot of what the next generation designs and the next generation cloud providers are trying to build. So if you took away anything today in the last few minutes, dense processors, fast networking, and optical is a must. Today's GPUs can drive roughly two times 400 gig, going to 800 gig. And a 10,000 GPU network, like I showed you in the AI spine case, can use as much as eight petabits today and demands that much of non-blocking bandwidth. Insufficient networking bandwidth can be a real problem. Imagine I have these expensive GPUs that can be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm going back and forth with data cycles, crunching the data, and if I have a 30% wait cycle, that means out of those hundreds of millions of dollars, a third of it is wasted. So getting the right network foundation, a faster, seamless, predictable, lossless, congestion-free network, not only requires a network, but also requires, and here we are at OFC, an improved optical interconnect. It's so interesting to watch that although we talk about bandwidth and perform performance, the largest contributor to power in a data center is not the network or the merchant silicon chip that the network is built on, but the optics. You can see here in the pie chart, the, in a 100 gigabit network, the optics is easily 35 to 40% of it. You go up to 400 gig, it's fast approaching 50. You go to 800, you're more than that, 55, 60%. And therefore, you need more fans to cool all of that as well. So how do we build, for all of these AI workloads, a power-efficient optical network? This imperative is why we're all here gathered at this conference and at this plenary, and I want to share with you different ways we can think of this problem. Obviously, you all know that in an AI network, we have a switch chip, but we also have the photonics. And the so photonics has two components. You can, go, you can have an electrical component, and you have to be electrically efficient. And this is the power of E. The E contributes power, which can be the switch chip, the retimers, the DSPs, et cetera. 
or you can be optically efficient and reduce the power there, which is reduce the power through the laser efficiency, the modulators, the switch voltage, insertion loss, et cetera. Let's talk about the electrical efficiency first. Many of you know and have been working on the co-packaged optics. This is a dramatic way to reduce the power efficiency by bringing the electrical and the op photonics closer together and making sure the advantages of this is you bring the power to a lower piece, you increase the performance across the I.O., and of course, by definition, you have lower cost because you don't have two packages. There are some challenges in terms of reliability, efficiency, pragmatic, practical cha challenges as you deploy thousands of these. How do you manufacture them? How do you service them? How do you return them back to factory? That are still being solved, but nevertheless, this is a very powerful way to reduce power. On the optical side, there are more powerful ways emerging as well by actually changing the materials. TFLN, thin film lithium neobate, as I understood it to be. My husband worked in the thin film industry many years ago, and I never knew we'd come back here again as photonics, can reduce the power of the O, where by coupling the laser efficiency, coupling efficiency modulators on a thin material, thin film material, you can now dramatically reduce the power. Now, we are demonstrating at our, uh, we have demonstrated the use of DSP and thin film lithium nearby technology last year, and you'll see it again in our um, labs today in the booth. But what would be the ideal power reduction is if you could bring the best of both, bring that signal integrity on both the electrical side and the optical side. And bringing that electrical and optical efficiency comes from removing the DSP completely and directly connecting the switch chip and the 30s to the photonics. And now you get the best of both worlds. You get the lower power, you get the lower latency, you get the lower cost, combined with no trade-off on reliability, manufacturing, or serviceability. This is what we call linear drive optics. And it's one of the most exciting inter introductions that the industry, and my team, and all of the teams have pioneered. You'll see that today and where you're now no more making the trade-off and you're getting a tremendous advantage in power. There are many materials, by the way, this make, that can make linear drive possible, not just TFLN, but this can run with silicon photonics and Vixels as well. But the beauty of this is now, pluggable optics can take you to the next generation of high bandwidth and low power. You can see here in this chart how with different switch silicons at 51 terabits and 100 terabits, at a system level, you can get a dramatic power reduction greater than 25% when you bring the switch, the fans, the CPU complex, and the optics using LD. LD and plug uh, optics is a real revolutionary advantage now because you can get the bandwidth and capacity and throughput and not have the massive power ingestion that we've all been experiencing. I've been sharing a lot with you right now on the theory of all the things we can do. But it would be great to see a technology demonstration, so let's take a look at a preview of how this happens in the labs. Hello everyone, and welcome to Arista Labs. We're very excited to demonstrate a new class of optical transceivers that we've been optimizing over the last three years, which we call linear drive modules. Linear drives are optical pluggables that do not include the DSP, offering lower power, lower latency, higher reliability, and lower cost. With today's shipping 100 gig 30s generation, we're measuring good bit error rate performance with floors reaching a few E-8 for the full E to O to E linear channel, as can be seen in this 25T system. Now, our industry really likes plug and play with an open multi-vendor ecosystem that is interoperable. But this really means one thing, performance margin. With the latest 51T switch silicon that integrates full DSP capabilities with much improved equalization and much lower SNR sensitivity, we're happy to report a three order of magnitude improvement in terms of bit error rate floor. With the latest 30s generation, we're demonstrating a linear drive optical interconnect using two optimized modules sitting on the edge ports of this 51T switch. We're measuring excellent performance after 10 kilometer 
of single mode fiber with prefect bit error rates reading a few E-8 and a few E-11, well within the KP4 FEC limit. If you'd like to learn more about linear drive modules, please make sure to stop by Arista booth number 5401. Thank you. Well, I want to especially thank Hassine and Andy Bechtelstein for that uh, demonstration in our lab. You could hear the fans and you could hear all the cooling that was going on in the lab there. And it's just fantastic to see these eye patterns with the right bit error rate. We have clearly entered the golden age of Petascale. I hope you share with me the excitement and enthusiasm of bringing next generation processors, next generation AI apps, into an amazing foundation for a Petascale AI-based network with the right power efficient interconnect. I'm excited to have been able to share this with you and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Jay Sri. Thank you very much, Jay Sri, for sharing your vision and the experience. And I think Linear Drive is just a great example of Arista's uh, pathfinding in the optics industry and Certainly Andy's passionate about it, uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, next, uh, the Jane M. Simmons Memorial Speakership honors contributions to optical network architecture, design, and planning. Uh, the 2023 honoree is Google Fellow Hong Lu for her contribution to system architecture of computing platforms, specifically for leading the world's first large-scale production deployment of optical circuit switches for data center networking. Yesterday, Hong presented Apollo large-scale deployment of optical circuit switching for data center networking and showed us how optical switches replace their spine layer. Um, on a personal note, I've worked with Hong as a supplier for 20 years, and I think Jeshri will agree with me, she's a very tough customer. Congratulations, Hong. Where, where is Hong? Thank you, Chris. Our final speaker, Wendell Wakes, will discuss decisions that define the course of our progress and how innovations in optical communications have the capacity to transform the world. Wendell has served as Corning's CEO since 2005 and as chairman of his board since 2007. Wendell joined Corning in 1983, holding roles in finance, business development, commercial, and general management. He went on, became vice president and the general manager of Corning's optical fiber business in 1996. I remember as a young general manager, he sometimes stopped by a meeting of a project where I was a technical leader. You know, he was standing behind us, the chairs. No pressure, guys. <laughs> by the way, I was young too at the time. Uh, and in 2001, he was named president of the optical fiber communication division, leading through dynamic market growth and the, the subsequent challenges of the telecommunication downturn. As Carling's the longest running CEO, he has played an instrumental role in several life-changing innovations, including the development of Corning Gorilla Glass, an innovation that led Corning's recognition as one of the world's most innovative company by fast company. An innovator at his core, he has earned 34 US patents and Euro for a CEO. And we call him chief application engineer at Corning. Wendell is a graduate of, of Lehigh University and earned MBA from Harvard University. He serves the board of directors at Amazon and on the board of trustees for the Corning Museum of Glass and the Institute for Advanced Study. 
I'm honored to welcome Window Wake. Thank you, Ming. Another round of applause for our Tyndall Award winner. Hi, everyone. Imagine with me a moment an entire city, even one the size of New York, powered by nothing but electricity? Of course, today we like take that absolutely for granted. We don't even talk about it. It strikes us as not the type of thing to imagine. But this was nothing but a vision in the late 1800s when scientists and business leaders saw that this force of nature had the potential to move society forward. But how? Well, one inventor had what he thought was an answer. Thomas Edison was working to perfect a filament that could effectively emanate electric light inside a glass bulb. And this technology could illuminate homes and businesses and, of course, the streets connecting them. Now, in general, uh, sort of the life and work of Edison inspires me. And now it's not just his incredible track record of innovation, but also his attitudes when he confronted obstacles. He sought out challenges that needed a solution, like the filament that would make the light bulb viable. And when he inevitably faced adversity, which he did many, many times in his life, he embraced it. It was fuel to throw on the fire and power through to his next achievement. Now, more specific to my work at Corning, I have like a little special memento that I keep framed in my office. And, and what you can see here is this is the original purchase order, the first record of sales for bulbs and tubing signed by Thomas Edison. Uh, that we delivered to him to enable his innovation. Now, for me, this piece of paper certainly marks the advent of an important and long-standing business for Corning and, of course, is one of the great milestones in the history of human progress. But more importantly, sort of every day, it reminds me of the enormous power of an idea when it is coupled with determination. Now with these bulbs, Edison began lighting New York City. For the few wealthy inhabitants of the blocks near his Pearl Street power station, they, and only they, had entered the future. Now among them was J.P. Morgan. Now he knew that electricity could revolutionize the way people lived. And he was determined to be at the absolute center of that paradigm shift. And he joined forces with Edison, helping create what ultimately became what we know today as General Electric. Now, they faced several obstacles. One was the inherent limitations of Edison's approach for transmitting power, which used direct current, or DC. It only reached a short distance and required a generator every few blocks. Of course, Edison, it's Edison. He did not back away from the challenge. But it was actually another great innovator who actually saw a better way forward. Nikola Tesla knew that alternating current, or AC, could travel much greater distances. So he actually came to work for Edison and proposed this to his employer. But Edison just believed it was too dangerous. He often told Tesla that Tesla was going to burn down the whole city. But Tesla was pretty determined as well. He found a backer for his idea. George Westinghouse was also working on AC. And there began one of the great contests of innovations 
Tesla versus Edison, Westinghouse versus Morgan, AC versus DC, and the contest was fierce. Edison used to publicize the dangers of AC in the press, while Morgan used his unparalleled business savvy to gain leverage over Westinghouse, competing viciously to tear down his competitors' financial stability. Now, a key showdown came with the announcement of a major hydroelectric power plant designed to connect a large area by harnessing another great force of nature, Niagara Falls. Whoever won the contract would gain a tremendous, almost insurmountable lead to dominate this nascent industry. Now, both sides wanted the job, but the Niagara Commission saw the promise of Tesla's offering, and his approach could use AC to transmit power from the Great Waterfalls at the top of New York State all the way to New York City. And thus, Westinghouse won the contract. But remember, J.P. Morgan was determined to build an industry. With the leverage that he had built over Westinghouse, Morgan wrested control of his competitors' patents. And in one of the great twists of business history, General Electric would become the dominant force in power. Morgan realized the vision of lighting New York and the nation with the very technology he and Edison had so vehemently fought. Now, what I take away from this story is the path of progress is not inevitable. And when we look back at innovation, when we say, wow, imagine New York City all powered by electricity, it all seems so obvious. But individuals matter. The people involved make decisions that inform the course of events. Edison could have easily pivoted his stance on AC and conceded, you know, Tesla had a pretty good idea. Westinghouse could have operated more strategically, shielding itself from Morgan's incredibly aggressive maneuvers. Morgan could have relented and shifted his focus to other industry. Yet, at the same time, all of this historical context, the drama that plays out moment by moment as industries are born and grow, it's obscured by the ultimate result. In this case, a network of electricity coursing across the globe, powering progress and moving the world forward. Many players contributed to this wonder. A whole ecosystem of ideas and actions collectively drove exploration, hit formidable obstacles, and through competition and collaboration, advanced society. Today, you and I are gathered here to think about another enormous transformation. Like our power infrastructure, a network of optical fiber has become vital to human progress. And once again, it's you know, easy to take for granted. I'll share another inspirational document. Now this one we actually keep in the office of our general manager of our optical fiber business. And what it is, is it is the purchase order marking our first major order of fiber from a key early player, MCI. Now from there, the industry advanced rapidly. Now we could easily think of this point as sort of the dawn of the modern era of telecommunications. But this purchase order means a lot more than that to me. The story does not start there. Nothing was inevitable. Just as once, it was only a vision to power New York City with electricity. It was just a theory that we could effectively transmit data through strands of glass. Just imagine connecting the world through optical fiber. It seems so obvious today. 
but it wasn't always. Once again, the key players weren't clear. And as you can tell from my early MCI reference, the ultimate winners weren't ordained. There was competition, there was collaboration, and for sure, there were obstacles. But what happens when innovators are chasing a life-changing vision? Well, Marcus Aurelius, one of my favorite thinkers, frames it perfectly. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. So let's dive into some of the obstacles our industry has faced and where our work is taking us next. The first challenge was attenuation. You know, to connect the world, you needed a medium that provides distance. How far can a signal travel in optical fiber? How do we keep the signal loss low? Now, we started asking these questions when Charles Cow inspired them with this seminal 1966 paper. If a glass fiber could reach an attenuation level of 20 decibels per kilometer, he said, it could actually replace copper links as bandwidth grew. As with Edison and Tesla, there were competing approaches to make this vision a reality. But in 1973, Corning scientists achieved what had seemed impossible, attenuation of 17 decibels per kilometer in a silica-based optical fiber. Now this was you know, a historic moment. And so we started to believe that perhaps you know, we could actually play a part in this paradigm shift. Now, you can gauge our excitement by an entry in the lab notebooks. This is the lab notebook from the day of Don Keck, who was doing the measurements, a long-standing OFC enthusiast. Now, I am speaking to a very technical group here, so I assume you are all familiar with his well-known scientific terminology, whoopee. Certainly we all lose that. Now, what I love about this image, so there's some people in this audience that actually know Don Keck, who were in LFC for many years, right? Don actually talks that way, right? Whoopee, like that is actually part of the way he actually talks and thinks. And so here we have, in this historic moment, this wonderfully human thing. And then, like, keep reading down. This I love. Left laser and electronics running during lunch. Now, what a wonderfully human thing. So I used to say to them, like, like what did you have for lunch? It was you sit down with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a glass of milk? Or, like, what do you do after something like that? Because huh, if I could get my experiments to work like that, I mean, I'd eat the same damn thing every day. But if you take sort of nothing more away from my talk, from whether I'm talking about electricity or talking about our challenges of the future, what I'd love you to take away is from that human moment. How, how human it is. How much it depends on individuals, whether collectively or just by themselves, to care enough to push progress forward. Now, of course, that team was followed by many, many more humans, and the attenuation has been reduced more than 100 times. And several competing technologies have tried to beat that. Now, I think it's exciting to see that some recent developments are being presented here at OFC, such as hollow core anti-resonant fibers with impressive performance. So clearly, I mean, we're not done. As we look ahead to new applications like quantum communications, the attenuation improvement journey must continue. Now, of course, in our pursuit of a connected world, we've had to solve for much more than distance. Great creativity and hard work have gone into increasing the amount of information we could transmit. We started with TDM and then quickly improved 
spectral efficiency, introducing EDFAs, WDM, FEC, and coherent transponders versus the first systems, which only had a capacity of about 10 megabits per second. The combination of all of these technology developments enables a capacity today in a single core fiber that is seven million times higher. And as we approach the sort of Shannon limit on fibers, the system capacity continues to grow, leveraging ideas like spatial division multiplexing and higher density cables. And we're even starting to see multi-core fibers become a reality. The lesson there is you create an obstacle for this crowd and we will find our ways. Now once you can go longer distance and can transmit more bits, uh, the next obstacle is overall cost per bit. Now we've been driving a significant decrease in cost due to all the improvements I've discussed. The results are most visible in long distance networks where transport cost is the key factor. In this chart from Steve Grubb of Meta, you can see an amazing 100,000 times reduction in dollars per bit per second in submarine networks. Now look at how that correlates so nicely with our ability to increase capacity. Now the variables change when we get to access networks, but the economics of fiber to the home deployments have also improved. Since the first fiber to the home deployment over 20 years ago, significant innovation and effort have driven costs down by more than 70%. However, in this space, the cost of civil works is the key factor. And that's why innovations like pre-engineered solutions have become so important. They make it cheaper and easier for operators to bring fiber access to more locations. But if we remember our vision of a world connected by fiber, we're still facing numerous obstacles to bringing fiber-fed connectivity to urban and rural areas alike in, in both developed economies and developing countries. And so to that end, many of the industry's newest innovations are focused on doing just that. Now, of course, as we connect more people, more communities, and more enterprises, what happens? They use more data. So to enable the continual rise in data transmission, we've also had to reduce the cost per bit inside data centers. And that has happened because of the work many of you in the audience have made possible, and including our previous speaker. And as the network data rates are increasing to 400G today, and will keep climbing as you just heard, the cost per bit continues to decline, enabling more connected users to have access to even more higher bandwidth applications. And now, I'll shift to one more obstacle, and it represents an important challenge, one that we need to keep tackling together, one in which the path of progress is far from inevitable. It is reliant on us to make the right decisions as we help deliver the benefits of optical networks while being ever more mindful of the environment. Now, I want to start by saying that the advancements in optical communications have already made an enormous positive impact on overall energy consumption. Now, it may not be obvious, but just for fun, uh, we looked into what would have happened with the total energy consumption of a single transatlantic system if we had kept the energy per bit at the 1988 levels. Now, that would be the yellow curve on this plot. Innovation and improvement from this entire industry saved more than three orders of magnitude in total energy per year. Now that is the equivalent to the energy generated by an entire nuclear reactor for a full year. 
and that is just for a single transatlantic system. But our society has become more and more dependent on ubiquitous and reliable connections. And to accomplish our mission of bringing these connections to everyone, we need to use less energy to generate these bits, less energy to modulate, transmit, amplify, switch, and receive, all while continuing to find new and creative ways to install and maintain all the required infrastructure using less energy and CO2. And this challenge gets more critical when you get into the confined space of data centers, more precisely inside switches and servers. Thermodynamic limitations and cooling requirements make this even more critical as we move towards hundreds of terabits per second, as you just heard from our previous speaker. Now, there is a lot of work going on in this space. A paper from NVIDIA presented at this conference uh, last year shows that we're on the right path. We've demonstrated a 10 times reduction in energy per bit in a switch ASIC. But we probably need another 10 times to get to less than one picojoule per bit. And in order to make that happen, uh, we need all parts of the network to make contributions. So, and our industry has certainly faced significant obstacles over the past 50 years. Attenuation, capacity, cost, energy, but we continue to find the way forward. Now, I hope historians look back and consider this to be sort of our round of the light game. And if we keep doing our job, we actually know who wins this game. I mean, everyone that we connect. We're literally expanding the bandwidth of human potential. Fundamentally, for all of us here today, our efforts are really rooted in one of the oldest of economic concepts. It says that if you take people and you ask us to survive and live and prosper, our probability of success scales dramatically with the more of us you bring together, the more of us you connect. And that is exactly what our industry is doing, bringing people together. Metcalf's law aptly frames it, a network's impact grows at the square of the number of nodes in the network. In other words, each person we add to the network increases its overall value. As you heard from the first speaker, we have a long way to go. So what we do collectively as an industry makes a real difference in the world. And looking ahead, I, we know the challenges. And only about 30% of people in the world have a fiber connection. So we've got our work cut out for us. But I'm confident that the obstacles will become the way. It'll take this whole ecosystem, everyone here, to keep moving forward. And that's why I'm actually so glad to be with you today. For Corning believes so deeply in individual contributions, in the deep humanity of innovation those key decisions that prove so monumental. And that's why we sponsor the Tyndall Award and all of the awards you saw today, because we believe in celebrating brilliant pioneers in our field, innovators like Ming and all the many other winners over the years. And we continuously support OFC because we believe in our collaborative output as well. We know the collective benefit to humanity will one day eclipse any of the historical context, any of what we all did as individuals. And 50 years from now, much like where I started when I talked to you about imagine electricity, 
we want our ambitions to just seem so obvious. Progress to seem like it was inevitable. And that this conference was where breakthroughs and new technologies are presented, contributing to the inspiration and innovation that will carry us forward. Everyone here doing their part. And it is so cool to be on this journey with you. I mean, as we try to make the world just a little bit better because we were in it. So, I hope you enjoy this terrific conference. I'm very grateful to Optica and IEEE for the many years of collaboration and, of course, to the program chairs and committee for inviting me to speak today. Thank you and have an awesome conference. Thank you, Wendorf, um, for this uh, wonderful talk. Yeah, the work of Window and uh, my colleagues at Corning doing is really uh, inspiring. Uh, it was a, our great pleasure to uh, bring you the three outstanding speakers. Uh, thank you, Patricia, uh, Jayshree, Wendell, uh, for sharing with us your visions. If you have any questions for them, I know I do. We have a chance to meet with them in the special conversation with panel speakers in the exhibit hall, theater three at quarter past 10. The exhibit hall is now open, whether you're in San Diego or online, we look forward to seeing you throughout the week. Thank you again, everyone, and please enjoy your afternoon.